Would you turn in your Bibles tonight to 2 Timothy? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1 to 7 is our text. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1 to 7 is our text. 2 Timothy is after 1 Timothy. For those who found 1 Timothy, you can just go to the next one and you'll be right there. Chapter 1, chapter 1, verse 1 to 7. Amen. The title of tonight's message is Spiritual Parenthood. Spiritual Parenthood. If you have found the text, please say Christ likeness. And would you rise with me as I read God's word in honor of his word tonight? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1 to 7. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers, recalling your tears, I long to see you, so that I may be filled with joy. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Louis, and in your mother, Eunice. And I am persuaded, now lives in you, lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying of my, on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may take your seats. Father God, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. No other name by which we are saved. We thank you for the presence and power of your Holy Spirit who allows us to recognize the wonderful works that Jesus has done for us on the cross. And we thank you that Jesus glorifies the Father. And now, Lord, would you illuminate our hearts to receive that which is true, pure, and holy. And may everything that is against your truth be removed from our minds and our thoughts that we would receive as clean vessels your truth to glorify you and to find our complete joy in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, Second Timothy is the last epistle uh, that Paul wrote around mid to uh, mid-60 AD, and it's the, the final letter he would write before he would go on into glory. It's a letter that he would write to his spiritual son, Timothy, and we've gone through 1 Timothy, and 2 Timothy is a little bit more personal, and uh, it shows the, the heart of a father, uh, and that's why I've uh, uh, called tonight's message and the next week's is spiritual parenthood, spiritual parenthood. There are some people that come uh, in the text we read tonight, and I want you to notice these names. The first name is Paul. Paul as the father, spiritual father of Timothy, and also in uh, a couple of verses uh, ongoing, we'll find the name Lois and Eunice, the grandmother of Timothy and the mother Eunice, and then you'll find another name, Timothy. These are the names that are portrayed, and you'll find that all of these names have connection to spiritual parenthood, spiritual parenthood. One question I want to ask all of us is, where are the spiritual fathers of this age? Where are the spiritual mothers of this age? Uh, And try to formulate an answer in your own hearts tonight. Where are the spiritual fathers and the spiritual mothers? When you think about a father or a mother, you may have so many different ideas according to your background, according to your upbringing. Some of you might say, yes, when I think of the word parent or mother or father, it's always about love and kindness and embrace. 
I remember my mother's cooking, or I, I remember the tendencies that my dad had, or the, some of the good things, of course. And then on the other hand, you might remember and recall to your memory some of the things that weren't too good that my mother was so strict or my father was so harsh. Uh, I didn't receive the en enough care and attention. I was often neglected, sometimes abused. They were far and distant, distant from me. And so many ideas can come. But according to God's standard of what uh, a godly father and a godly mother ought to be, really needs to be embedded into our hearts. And our memories uh, need to be uh, cleansed by the truth of God's word. Now, I'm not minimizing the uh, memories that you have of your parents. Uh, take the good things and forgive them for the bad things that they've done, yeah? Uh, that's a good way to really cleanse our hearts to receive God's word. But where are the spiritual fathers of today? And I want to give you a, a couple of uh, ideas for you to see where you are on this trajectory of spiritual growth. Because I believe through uh, the faith, we have those who are spiritual children and those who are spiritually young men and women, and then there are spiritual fathers and mothers. I believe that we can uh, divide that into three stages of our lives, just like our physical uh, stages. But nowadays, we find many uh, adult children as well. Uh, their bodies are all grown, but their insides are still left at eight-year-old, right? Uh, but nonetheless, let's try to divide uh, these into three categories. What is a spiritual child? What is a spiritual child? Well, according to 1 John chapter 2, verse 12, spiritual children know their sins are forgiven and they know the Father. They begin to recognize that they have been embraced by the Father and that they have been forgiven. So they are birthed. Uh, in uh, the Christian world, we call that a born again. You are born again uh, into the family. So you, are, uh, you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you acknowledge the Father, and the Spirit of God is within you, but you really don't know that for sure right now because you're very, very young, very, very young. These spiritual children will often uh, call out to the Father, and the, the Father will give them almost everything that they call out for. Why? They're babies. So whatever they call out for, it's something that they need for nourishment, for growth. And some of these people in this category, uh, uh, they experience so much intimacy. Like, I, I prayed for lemonade, and next, the next day somebody gave me lemon. I mean, it's like amazing. You know, they're always talking about these wonderful things that are happening. And it's a beautiful start of a relationship. But at the same time, there are tendencies in the spiritual children uh, aspect that there are many uh, immature things that happen. Like the first time you hear the word no from your father. I don't like that. Maybe, maybe he doesn't like me no more. Right? Uh, the father has done 99 good things to you, and the first time he says no and puts his foot down, you feel like, oh, he's abandoned me, forgetting all the good things that God has done. That's a sign of immaturity that needs to grow into spiritual young men, spiritual young women. See, according to, again, 1 John 2, we see that they no longer, as they grow up, need to be spoon-fed the Word of God. Uh, but what they need is, what they experience is the Word of God abides in them and that they have learned to feed on the Word to overcome the wicked one. They have learned to feed for themselves. It's like, you know, seeing a baby grow up. And I've witnessed, you know, three of my children growing up, and I'm still experiencing that. You know, he's beginning to put things in his mouth. He's like, oh, yeah. And uh, before you know it, he's into these candy bars, and he's really quiet. And before you know it, he's actually chewing gum all by himself. We're like trying to get it out of his mouth. Now he's feeding himself. He's hungry. He's trying to get into stuff. But, and as he grows, he'll learn to feed on good things, nutritious things. Spiritual young men and women are able to feed on the word of God. They're able to, to deal with the, the challenges that come when the word of God really hits and impacts us. They're able to digest these things. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. 
The only problem is young men and young women, spiritual young men and young women, sometimes can get really dogmatic, which means it's like, I know it, I know it all. Don't talk to me about those things. I know it. I've read the word. It's in me. And they sometimes want to go their own directions. Uh, maybe like an 18-year-old, any 18-year-olds in this house? You know, like, I know it all now. And I, I'm, I'm an adult. Uh, are you an adult at 18? I forget. What, what, what is it in America? Legally, yes. But I, I hear some hesitance there in your voice. Legally, yes. <laughs> but maybe there needs to be some more growing done, right? And that's the truth for all of us. Some of us may fit into that category of young men and women who are spiritually growing. Then we come into uh, the mature part of spiritual parents, spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers. Well, simply put, when you grow up and when you get married, by the grace of God, you will have either natural children or adopted children. Can I get an amen? By the grace of God, we'll have children. And if you live long enough, you'll have grandchildren. Praise the Lord. If you live long enough, you'll have great-grandchildren. Praise the Lord for that. It's a good thing because life comes from God. Now, spiritual parents have this understanding that parenting is going to get messy. Whether it's by natural birth or by adoption, there's always going to be some dynamic you're really busy, you, you have to get to an appointment, but just before you go, your kid says what? I need to go pee. I, I need to ch diaper change, you know, and, and, and you know, you have to make changes for that. You have to make room for these things. But parents don't scold their kids for those things. Like, oh, yeah, of course, we understand. And we'll teach them and love them and say, maybe next time, you know, you can go to the bathroom. At this time, it'd be better for you. You can teach them. Um, I mean, it's up to them to receive and to apply that. But nonetheless, uh, the parents continue to teach with love and care and endurance. For Paul, he is a spiritual parent. The name Onesimus, you may uh, remember from reading the word of God. Onesimus was a natural spiritual son for Paul. He preached the gospel, and he saw Onesimus be converted, be born again. So Paul to Onesimus is a natural spiritual father. But for Timothy, he is an adopted son. Timothy had already received the faith from his grandmother Lois to his mother Eunice, and he had grown up in the faith, and Paul has adopted this young man and has become his protege, an adopted spiritual son. And Paul is writing to Timothy at the end of his life. So that sets the tone from a father to a son. Last words, personal, poignant, but also fragrant. Because he wants to leave a mark, not only just for his son Timothy, but so that the church of Jesus Christ and the gospel can flourish even after Paul has gone on to heaven. So with that, let's go on and read verse 1 and verse 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul makes sure uh, to let Timothy know that he has been sent. He is a sent one from Jesus Christ by the will of God according to the promise of life. This word promise of life, it'll come uh, in the later chapters because Paul knows that his days are drawing near. He writes to Timothy, his dear son, son in the faith. And then he gives a greeting, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. You may recognize that grace and peace is a language that Paul would use in many different epistles, but to Timothy and to those in the pastoral epistles, grace, mercy, and grace, uh, sorry, grace, mercy, and peace is given. And one person uh, who, who would uh, just go deeply in, in study of God's word would say this, pastors, leaders of the church, 
not only need grace and peace, they need a lot of mercy. And I apply that to my own heart. I need a lot of mercy, which is not getting what I deserve. Not getting what I deserve. Because what I deserve is <laughs> wrath. What I deserve is the wrath of God. But because of his love for me and his love for you, he will not give you what you rightly deserve, but let his own son receive the punishment for sin. It's a beautiful word because as you are invited into leadership or spiritual parenthood, we need to have a strengthening in our souls, that we need an anchor of our souls so that we will not be tossed around by the waves and the winds. You need a, a structured, a deep rootedness. And that's where God's mercy comes in. He washes me and his grace provides for me a way to stand up before God and say, Lord, I have nothing to offer you, but it is by your grace I come, and I thank you for your mercy. And then the fruit of all of that is the irony, the shalom, the peace of God that reigns within my heart. This is so important for those who are in ministry. And then Paul goes on to thank God. He thanks God whom I serve as my forefathers did with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. A spiritual father will always pray for their children. Just like physical parents will always check in on their kids. Prayer is the most relationally deep thing that any spiritual parent will do. You will not forget to pray for them. And I look back on the ministry that the Lord has allowed me to have here for the last 13 years. I was just talking to somebody today. I spent my 30s in this, in this house, praying, singing, worshiping, crying, laughing, eating a lot of food with you, potlucks, cakes, birthdays, funerals, baby dedications, baptisms, holding your hand in the hospital visiting you in your workplaces. And the Lord has been so good because the Lord has given me a love for our congregation that I lift you up, our congregation, each day. Lord, bless them, watch over them, take care of them, protect them. Would you provide for them? Would you grant them your favor today, your wisdom today, your discernment today? Would you give them everything that you have given me and more, the spirit of wisdom and revelation to know Jesus more and more? Would you make them lovesick? And these are parts of my prayers that I pray for you. And then when I know that there are people sick and people who are in need of much more prayer and care, I pray for them, Lord, would you come and rescue them? Would you come and touch them and heal them and make them whole? Any spiritual parent will pray for their children. And Paul is reminded of how thankful he is to God for his spiritual son, Timothy. And then in verse 4, Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. How does Paul, the father, recall the tears of his spiritual son, Timothy? The Bible doesn't really give us a clear understanding of the meaning of the tears, but when do you cry? Anybody? When do you cry? Anybody? Yes, Jake. Happy and sad. Happy and sad. Interesting, isn't it? Tears can mean both things. Sometimes you're happy, you cry. You know, sometimes you're sad, you cry. Sometimes deep tears come from a deep sense of not being able to express in words, but your body and your, your, your tears express something. Perhaps Paul had to leave Ephesus and Timothy being left there, they had to say goodbye and that goodbye was probably going to be a permanent goodbye. And perhaps Timothy, his face flowed down with tears. Of course, with the joy and the hope of meeting him in again uh, in, the, in heaven, but also the, the heart, the anguish, the, the sadness of being able to have to let him go. So Paul remembers 
the tears. Paul also remembers what? He's reminded of the faith. Verse 5, I've been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. This faith is important. Why? Because Timothy has to become the proclaimer of the faith, but a person who lives out the faith. Imagine having pastors who are just actors, who come up, they, they act as if they believe in God, right? They act as if they actually, you know, they've, they believe in this, and, but it's just all an act. And do you know how that's found out? In the fruit of your lives, in your relationships. My relationship with my wife, my relationship with my children, my relationship with my mentors, my relationship with you, my relationship with time, my relationship with nature, my relationship with how I spend my money, all of these things are related to the faith. And Paul is saying, I remember that faith. I remember that legacy of faith that has been poured unto you. And again, these names, Lois and Eunice. Why? The legacy of faith flows down. Your prayers will not go unheard for your children and to your spiritual children. So all the more we pray. I tell you many a times that our church's uh, driving engine of our ministries is our prayer meetings. Early morning prayer, Sunday night prayer, right? All of these times and your personal times of prayer, my own personal times of prayer. And what the Lord does is this. He continues to build faith in me and in you. We just sang it tonight that, that God will bring about you know, about a miracle, even through impossible situations, God is able to break through. God is able to reveal himself. God is able to woo the worst of sinners. That's the power of fervent prayer by faith. By faith. And if your faith is lacking, pray this, Lord, grant me more faith. Or even open my eyes to see the caliber of the faith that you have granted me. Have you ever had a coach that saw something in you and said, I see potential in you, son. I see potential in you, daughter. Well, the coach wouldn't call you son or daughter, right? But nonetheless, you know, your name. And they pulled it out of you. They coached you through it. They mentored you. They, they drilled you to do this and that. And they brought out the best in you. And that's what spiritual parenthood is like. And then Paul goes on, verse 6, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. What is this fanning into flame? Anybody made a fire before? Anybody been camping? Okay. So uh, I, it's one of my, my hobbies, if you don't know already. I, I like everything that's concerned with fire. Uh, one of my hobbies is to harvest wood and then chop it up and uh, dry it for a little while. And then I love making fires. You know, I'll put some sticks together. And then back in the day, I was really poor at discerning what kind of wood will actually burn. One day, I put all of these, like, uh, woods that were all drenched in water. They were all soggy. And I, I called my uh, small group, my Bible study. I'm like, I'm going to show you how to make a fire. I failed miserably that night. All I got was smoke, and I was out of breath because I couldn't, I couldn't get this to work, just all smoke. But a person who is good at making fires understands how to position things, understands, you know, you need, you know, wood, dry wood to, to be there, and you need fire, you need air, and then you, you need to be able to fan into flame and keep it burning. And many a times we use, you know, cardboard and, and just... Continue to fan it. Continue to fan it. Let the air in. Let the air in. Let the air in. And as the air comes in, the fire goes up and up and up. And, and you're like, wow, this is amazing. So recently for my birthday, in my fire pit, I built the biggest fire that I've ever built. It was a birthday present to me. And I found it so satisfactory. Just chugging in all of the wood. Fire! You know what I mean? It was all, all by myself, and nobody's around, but I just loved it. 
But a fire, the gift of God, has to be fanned into flame, and nobody else does that for you. You do it, because you know the gift that God has given you. You know deep in your heart when God has gifted you with these spiritual gifts that it is from God. You did not conjure that up. You did not make it up yourself. But you remember God's word. You remember that time when the Lord gave you those gifts. And for Timothy, it was the imparting of the gifts by the laying on of hands. And I still believe that the laying on of hands is important today as it was in Paul's time. We need to lay hands on people and pray and they'll be healed and there'll be gifts that are imparted. So my gifts is imparted to you. Your gifts are imparted to me. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. And we fan those gifts into flame. And guess what happens? We have a big fire party. The whole world recognizes that Jesus is Lord and you don't need to market a fire. People will just come. So this is a reminder. The spiritual father is giving to the spiritual son, Timothy. Fan into flame the gift of God that was imparted to you by the laying on of hands. It is good. But the flip side is this. Be careful whenever somebody lays hands on you. If you sense some darkness, if they want to pray in the name of anything else but Jesus, you be careful. That's wisdom, friends. That's discernment. But in the house of the Lord, amen, you can come and we can lay hands and anoint you with oil and pray. And then you can go on and fan that gift into flame. Not only that, verse 7, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. When I think about Timothy, and as we've studied Timothy together, he's, he's not the strongest candidate to become Paul's protege. And I love that about Timothy. He had uh, some problems with his stomach. It seems like he's a little bit timid, not as ferociously bold as Paul was. Remember what Paul did when he actually stood up to Peter, to his face? Bold as a lion. Why? Because he was doing wrong. But how dare you do that to Peter, one of the real disciples of Jesus. But for Paul, it doesn't matter. Because, why? The truth has been given, deposited to him, in him, and he has to speak up. Because there cannot be any hypocrisy. But for Timothy, he seems to be a little bit weak. He seems to not have have it all. He might not have been picked in the show Apprentice. (laughs) You know, he he might have been like the last one there. But that's what I love about God's plan and purposes. Because he chooses the weak and he makes them strong. He chooses the one that, that are the lowliest that are probably not the right candidate just like me for this position. I am not the right candidate. I don't have it. I don't have it. But when you have a servant of the Lord who knows that they don't have it, then who do they depend on? On the Lord. And I believe Timothy, although his body may have been weak, maybe his mentality was a little bit timid, but one thing he had was faith in the God who called him. And so Timothy would always, I believe, by faith, come and and remember and fan into flame the gift of God and, and remember the teachings that Paul had given him about Jesus and continue that journey of faith. God does not give us a spirit of timidity. Sometimes we mix up timidity with humility. Anybody? Oh, I'm just, I'm just being humble, pastor, because I'm the most humble person in the world. That doesn't make sense. You know, I'm, you know, I'm not sharing the gospel because I'm just being humble. I just pray. No, when you pray, <laughs> you, you are anointed to do the works of God, right? But God does not give us a spirit of fear or timidity in this case. He gives us what? Power? 
love. In the King James, the sound mind, sound doctrine, self-discipline. Yes. He gives us things that are innately different with our nature. It is a supernatural power. It is a supernatural love. It is a supernatural way of being able to order my life as God would have me live it. It's a beautiful thing. And if I had my way of commentating on this text, I would say this is the best way to become a human being. The real person of God that God created you and I to be. Being restored to the image of God. And when we become real human beings, not human doings, by the way, when we become real human beings in light of eternity, when we become human beings that know our destiny in the Lord and our hearts are aligned to his will and purposes, then we'll find joy and peace. We won't worry so much. And we'll have the faith that God will finish the work that he started in us. So we need not fear. So let me ask you, as we continue this series, where are you in your spiritual journey? Are you a spiritual child? Are you a young person? Or are you a spiritual father? Or a spiritual mother? A spiritual parent? It's a sobering question. Because I think some churches are run like nurseries. We have a bunch of children around and nobody is raising them up. There aren't enough spiritual fathers in the church, in other words. We need more mature believers who are committed to the will of God, who are able to pray and persevere and pour in to those who are growing up in the church. We need more fathers. We need more mothers. Think about Lois. Think about Eunice. Think about Paul. Think about Jesus. Who are you discipling? By adoption or by natural birth? Who are you pouring into and loving and enduring and persevering? Because without that spiritual maturity in God's house, we will always be like spiritual children who are clamoring for attention. My way, my way, my way. Or like spiritual adults, young spiritual men and women who are like, no, I, I know much more than you, so you, you got to do it my way. But rather we have spiritual parents who pour in to the young who pour into their children and raise up these, these kids into adulthood and these adults that can, be, can make disciples. We need more fathers in this house. We live in this generation of fatherlessness. So many people who do not have fathers in their homes. Oh my goodness, I've heard stories of those who will just go their own way hang out with the wrong crowd because they think they can find something there and find nothing but just emptiness, being used and abused. We need fathers who will really love on their spiritual children, love them, care for them, nurture them, pray for them, hang out with them, have ice cream with them. Where are the spiritual mothers in this church? Where are the spiritual fathers? And then it brings me to a point of repentance in my own heart. Lord, am I truly in that category of spiritual parenthood? And the answer is no. Sometimes I find myself in this camp in some areas. Sometimes I find myself in this camp in some areas. And sometimes, yes, I find myself in this camp too. Praise the Lord. I'm not all over here. I'm not all over here. But sometimes I see myself reverting back to these areas. And that's when I have to say, Lord, I repent. I come to you and I need your help in these areas. 
And then the Lord restores and helps me to fan into flame the gifts of God. And I'm reminded of the calling that this place is not where I raised my hand and said, I'll do it. I did not apply for this job, by the way. I was called, called by his grace, received so much mercy. And by his grace and mercy and by his peace and by his power, God is enabling me to serve. And I'm growing, still growing. How about you? Where are you? Do you spend most of your time in spiritual childhood? Do you spend most of your time in spiritual young adulthood? Or do you spend most of your time in nurturing and caring and discipling people? As Paul writes to Timothy, what would be your letter to your disciple as you write your final letter to them? Think about those things and we'll come back next week and continue this spiritual parenthood through the principles that Paul writes to Timothy. Think about it. And if you're here, we need to move on to here. Can I get an amen? If you're here, we need to move on to spiritual parenthood. This is where God wants us to be. Let us pray. Father, we are reminded of where we need to be as spiritually mature men and women of God, fathers and mothers. Thank you for the upbringing Timothy had through the faith coming from his grandmother Lois to his mother Eunice and then to Timothy. We thank you for the faith that Onesimus was able to find through Paul. We thank you for the many people in our lives that really breathe life into us. They shared the gospel with us. They loved us at our worst and continue to love us. There are people, Lord, that have invested so much into us through your grace. Now help us as those who have received the message, nurture and care and disciple. Help us to become spiritual parents, O oh Lord. May we raise up more spiritual parents in this house. Bring us to maturity, Lord. No longer being fed by milk, but those who are able to handle the meat of God's word. Embrace it. Chew it. Digest it and receive all the nutrients that you have from your word. So God, mature us, we pray. Help us to grow up a little, we pray. Help me to, to grow <laughs> into spiritual maturity. And nobody is there yet. We're all growing together. Help us to be challenged, but also encouraged tonight, so that the gospel message will continue in that legacy of faith. May we have more Pauls. May we have more Lewises. May we have more Eunices. May we have many more Timothys. All for your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.